Indian immigrants are absolutely crushing it in America. The average American household earns $65,000 a year. White Americans, just a touch higher. Most Asians do better here, like Chinese Americans at $85,000, but Indians are in a league of their own, averaging $120,000 a year per household. And here's the crazy part. Back in India, the economy is a dumpster fire. So how do these immigrants come to America and kick ass? They make up just 1% of the country, but own over half of the hotels. They succeed wildly in many industries, especially tech, where a third of all Silicon Valley startups have an Indian founder or co-founder and head some of the biggest tech companies in the world. In just a few decades, Indian Americans have gone from being a barely noticeable minority to a powerhouse. They've cracked the code on how to thrive here, and they did it in a single generation. I'm Ken LaCourt, and I love looking at sometimes awkward topics, especially when we can learn valuable lessons from them, like this one. We often hear that the American dream is dead, but it's working in spades for Indian immigrants. Figuring out that why will give us more insight into how to succeed than most self-help books ever will. We'll dive into three key factors. The first is U.S. immigration policies, because the average Indian isn't coming here. America's getting many of their best and brightest. Second, they value education like no other group. And then they select careers in fields that profit. Huge factors. And then perhaps the biggest root of their success Indian cultures and the values it holds. It encompasses everything from Indian kids watching half as much television as others to cohesive families, including arranged marriages that help build long-term wealth. But let's take a quick look at India itself because from a financial point of view, it pretty much sucks. It's the world's most populous country with a billion and a half citizens, but its economy is about the same size as California, which has 1 37th as many people. The average income is just $2,200 per year. That's $6 a day. Millions of people there live in abject poverty without basic sanitation or clean water, and about a quarter of its residents are illiterate. Corruption runs heavy both in the government and private industry, something that always destroys an economy, and it has a substandard education system. It's the kind of place where if you're not already wealthy but want to be, you just might want to leave. And many of the most ambitious, driven Indians do just that. In the early 20th century, Indian immigration to the United States was limited, with racial discrimination and legal barriers to citizenship. The real game changer came in 1965 with the Immigration and Nationality Act, which abolished national origin quotas and it prioritized skilled labor and it laid the foundation for the influx of highly educated Indian professionals to come here. Today, a large portion of Indian immigrants come on H-1B visas designed for trained, specialized workers. In recent years, Indians received the lion's share of those as the U.S. wanted to draw in talent for technology, engineering, and medicine. Now, that's certainly not every Indian who's coming here. Many come in through family reunification or other channels. And it also doesn't mean that the immigrants who are coming here are already wealthy. They're not but many certainly have a leg up with education, so they're not an accurate cross sample of everyone in India. This selection bias is a huge reason why the U.S. does so well economically. With the exception of Native Americans and those taken here as slaves hundreds of years ago, every American is a descendant of someone who was unhappy and ambitious enough to say, screw this place, I'm leaving and I'm going to America. That helps a country thrive and it hurts the countries they leave. But for the immigrants who come, the concept of self-selection doesn't diminish their achievement one bit. They have a burden of often leaving their families and their support structures behind and starting over in a strange land. And it also doesn't help if you don't do anything with the chance you've been given. Indian Americans did, and they honed in on education as the pathway to success. And not just any education, but the kind that leads to high paying jobs. Let's start with the raw numbers. 80% of Indian immigrants get a college degree. That compares to just 33% of U.S. born citizens. That's a massive gap. And nearly half of Indian immigrants also hold graduate or professional degrees, almost four times the rate of the average American. Indian American families place a high value on their children's education and make some serious sacrifices so their kids get that education. And what are they studying? They flock to STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. Over a third major in engineering and another third in math or computer science. They're not messing around with soft subjects. They're learning things that pay off in the job market. So it's no coincidence that Indian Americans are overrepresented in the tech industry. I mentioned about a third of Silicon Valley startups have an Indian co-founder, and the roster of Indian CEOs is impressive. But beyond Silicon Valley, STEM degrees are the golden ticket to some of the highest paying jobs in the country. 
While their peers are racking up debt for degrees in the arts, Indian American students are often strategically choosing career paths that translate into big paychecks. They're making calculated decisions based on earning potential and market demand. They recognize that tech skills are the key to unlocking opportunity and are willing to put in the blood, sweat, and tears to acquire those skills. Now that comes with a downside from pressure to succeed, which can lead to stress and other problems, to wondering whether these kids are pursuing STEM because they love it or because they're being pushed into it. Are we losing potential artists, writers, and musicians to the draw of a larger paycheck? There aren't easy answers to those questions, but the Indian success story isn't just about hitting the books or choosing the right major. It's about having a vision for your life and pursuing it with gusto. It's about sacrificing short-term pleasure for long-term gain. Those are some of the core values of their culture and families, and I'd argue that that's where their success starts. In America, the phrase family values is denigrated into arguments about gay parents, but Indian Americans have some of the strongest family values you'll find anywhere. Extended families, often living together or close by, creating a tight-knit support system. Grandparents help raise the kids, passing down their values. Cousins can be as close as siblings, and there's a mindset that they're in it together. In fact, it's common for multiple Indian families to share a home while building a business together. They live frugally, minimize expenses, and reinvest in the business rather than splurging. It's the ultimate form of delayed gratification, sacrificing short-term comfort for long-term gain. This family-centric culture has a lot of benefits. For one, it provides a built-in safety net. Need to save money? Move in with your parents for a bit. Need help with the kids? Grandma's got you covered. It allows Indian Americans to take risks, start businesses, and bounce back from setbacks more easily. It also keeps their families intact. Indian Americans have crazily low divorce rates. Only 6% of Indian immigrants with children divorce, while 40% of overall Americans do. Now, I know we look at weddings here as a love match, but practically speaking, it's a business arrangement as well. Two married adults are almost always going to be more financially successful than two adults maintaining separate households. People divorce for a lot of reasons, some of them necessary, but I've never met anyone who saved money by getting divorced. It's not a path to riches. And in Indian culture, many families approach marriage practically. Most marriages in India, over 90%, are still arranged by families, and some of that practice carries over here. They're also more likely to marry people with the same religion and background, which helps keep them together. And overall, the stigma of divorce is much stronger than what we typically see in America. It ties into what I consider the most important culture value that really drives their success, delayed gratification. Indian Americans play the long game. They're willing to sacrifice those short-term pleasures for long-term gains. Their households save an average of 25% of their income compared to just 5% for the average American. They're not blowing their paychecks on the latest gadget or designer clothes. They're saving it, investing it, and using it to start businesses or buy real estate or do something else smart with it. I saw this my whole life. My parents were born in the Great Depression and it affected them throughout their whole lives. I had a pretty successful career, but I've never owned a new car and most of my clothes come from Target, like this shirt. To me, the concept of a $120 shirt is like spoiled milk. But delayed gratification isn't just about money. It applies to almost every aspect of life. Indian kids usually aren't the ones parting away weekends in college. They're studying, interning, building up their resumes. They're not taking gap years to find themselves. They're getting their degrees and jumpstarting their careers. Now there's a downside to that, short-term happiness. But for most Indian Americans, the trade-off is worth it. They're playing a different game with higher stakes and bigger rewards. They're not just trying to get by, they're trying to build something lasting, something that they can pass down to their kids and grandkids. They're living the American dream on steroids, and we should all take a close look at how to do the same. And here's the thing, their success isn't just about them, it affects all of us, the whole country. Indian Americans are creating jobs, starting companies and innovating. Companies they started employ over a half a million people here and generate over $100 billion of revenue annually. Successful people make successful countries. Which is why I found it interesting to also look at Haiti and the Dominican Republic, two countries on one island. They face many of the same challenges, foreign invaders, dictators, disasters, the whole nine yards. But the gap between them is mind blowing and people aren't honest about the reasons why. Hey, I'm Ken LaCourt. I learned a lot making this video and I hope I shared some of that with you. Come back again.